So with that, I'll get started. My name is Elizabeth Karcher. I'm the executive director at the Woodrow Wilson House here in Washington, DC. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of our speaker series for the spring semester. Uh, we have a lot to cover in today's talk, but before we do, I just want to give you a, a quick update at the Wilson House. Um, we have, uh, unfortunately, as many of you know, Washington DC uh, museums are closed at the moment and that has been extended to uh, January 22nd. So the Wilson House will acknowledge and uh, honor that. Um, but we will continue with our speaker series and our virtual programming. So um, we have uh, started this again and we had requested uh, for sponsors. So it is with great thanks and gratitude to our sponsors that we are uh, hosting today's speakers series. Is uh, The speaker series is brought to you through generous contributions and donations from Carrie C. Fuller, Nancy Bliss, Edward Gerber, uh, Christopher Keller. Um, we will be hosting the speaker series on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month at from noon to one o'clock. We'll have uh, continue to have notable historians, curators, and leaders explore the social movements of the 20th century and the relevance to today. Uh, we'll explore, continue to explore talks on women's suffrage, activism, protests, of course today propaganda, racial inequity, social inequity, and the consequences and the legacy of Woodrow Wilson's presidency. Uh, today's talk, we have uh, John Maxwell Hamilton. He's a longtime journalist and author of, and public servant. He's the Hopkins Brazil Professor of Journalism at the LSU Manship School of Mass Communication. He's a global scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. And he's the senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. In his 20 years as an LSU administrator, Hamilton was founding dean of the Manship School and executive vice chancellor and provost. Throughout that time, he enthusiastically taught students and guided graduate students research a pursuit to which he remains dedicated as a journalism professor. He's a journalist and has reported for the Milwaukee Journal, the Christian Science Monitor and ABC Radio. He was a longtime commentator for Marketplace, broadcast nationally by Public Radio International. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, The Nation, among other publications. In government, Hamilton oversaw nuclear non-proliferation issues for the House Foreign Affairs Committee, served in the Department of State during the Carter administration as an advisor to the head of the US foreign aid program in Asia, and managed a World Bank program to educate Americans about economic development. He served in Vietnam as a Marine Corps platoon commander and in Okinawa, as a reconnaissance company commander. After retiring from administration in 2012, Hamilton was a public policy scholar in residence at the Wilson Center and has continued his affiliation as a global scholar. He serves on the board of the International Center for Journalists where he is treasurer and was on the board of directors of the Lamar Corporation listed on NASDAQ as the largest outdoor advertising company in the US as measured by number of displays. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Hamilton received the Freedom Forum's Administrator of the Year Award in 2003. Other honors include two Green Eye Shade Excellence in Journalism Awards, the Blythe Award from Marquette University, and an MLK Day Diversity Award from LSU. He's received funding from the Carnegie and Ford Foundations, among others. In 2002, he was a Shoreheim Fellow at Harvard University's Kennedy School for Government. He has served twice as a Pulitzer Prize jurist. Hamilton's most recent book, was published in 2020. It is Manipulating the Masses, Woodrow Wilson and the Birth of American Propaganda. His previous book, Journalism's Roving Eye, A History of American Foreign Reporting, won the Goldsmith Prize from the Shorstein Center on Media, Politics and Public Policy. The Book of the Year Award 
from the American Journalism Historians Association and the Tankard Award from the Association of Education in Journalism and Mass Communication. He is editor of the LSU Press book series from our own correspondent. So with that, I'd like to welcome John Hamilton. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Like all authors, uh, I obviously want to promote my book. But more than that, I'm really interested in promoting the ideas in the book. Uh, this is a history book. It's about the Committee on Public Information. And I'm going to devote most of my time with you to that subject. But the CPI has a legacy. And uh, that legacy is highly relevant today. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions that pivot off of that. The CPI, the Committee on Public Information, was the first and only, is the first and only ministry of propaganda we have ever had. It was created one week after the United States entered the war in April 1917, and it lasted only throughout the war. Uh, but what it did and the way it operated has carried on. And uh, as I say, that's part of what we'll talk about. Uh, to think about making that bridge from the past to the present, we can think about this comment that was once made about Woodrow Wilson, that he was the high priest of propaganda, the greatest propagandist the modern world has ever known, displaying extraordinary skill and dexterity. Then we can have today Donald Trump, who has been called the greatest propagandist who ever occupied the White House. These two different men from two different parties show us how easy it is to push the boundaries of presidential propaganda power. It's not a great stretch to go from Woodrow Wilson suppressing unwelcome comment by calling it enemy talk to President Trump using the term fake news to fence back information that he doesn't want to hear uttered. Or I might add for President Trump to show up after the election in, uh, in the White House saying he actually had won with hail to the chief playing in the background. The individual that Wilson put in charge to the Committee on Public Information is a man named George Creel, who deserves a book all by himself. Uh, Creel was a progressive muckraking journalist and in many cases as unhinged as Trump himself has been. Uh, there are many entry points to talk about the CPI uh, because it was a, it's, a very, it's a sprawling story. Uh, we could start with the good things it did. Uh, the CP, there's a picture right there of George Creel uh, who, by the way, even his mother said he wasn't very handsome. Uh, uh, we could start with the good things, as I say. Uh, the CPI started the official bulletin, which today appears as the Federal Register and many other government publications that makes our government more transparent. It pioneered the concept of public diplomacy. And in fact, there are heroes in this book, like Vera Whitehouse, a woman who went abroad, there's Vera, who went abroad and had to fight the government the diplomatic bureaucracy in Switzerland to try to do above board propaganda. That picture there with her dog is a dog that she bought in uh, London on the way back to Bern. She left once to go, to go uh, argue that she should be left alone. She went visit personally to visit uh, Wilson to plead her case. And when she came back, she bought a dog because she wanted at least one person in Bern who was her friend. Uh, the roots of the VOA Education exchange programs, overseas reading rooms, they all lie with the CPI. It invented public service advertising. Those are all very good things. But we could also start from another angle and look at what the CPI did to subvert democracy, the very democracy that it was meant to promote. George Creel said that his job was to emphasize the committee as an informative service for the Germans had grimed propaganda until the word stood for corruption and deceit. I was to spend no dollar on a secret errand or to try to camouflage a single activity. Above all, I must guard against appeals to hate. That, he said, was his mandate from President Wilson. But in fact, Wilson, uh, Creel did all of those things with Wilson's blessing. The CPI worked through front organizations to direct the thinking of immigrants and labor. With the censorship power derived from the Espionage Act, it fenced back inconvenient opinion and called, back, and called on the country to listen to official facts. In fact, it published a document, a syndicated column, column called Official Facts. We could also start, start with the CPI's involvement with a subject that is highly relevant to today, which is Russian disinformation. Only in this case, the story has an odd twist to it. Uh, the CPI rammed white Russian disinformation down the throats of the American public. It's an extraordinary story all by itself. 
The white Russians had faked documents to portray the Bolsheviks as German agents, not as real Russians. The Wilson em administration embraced this idea because they wanted to delegitimize the Bolsheviks and legitimize Wilson's decision to invade Russia with the Allies. This was an extraordinary case of confirmation bias. And as it turned out, it helped poison relations with the Soviet Union later, and it led to the American Red Scare at the time. Or we could start with Wilson's reelection campaign in 1916, uh, a part of the story that I didn't expect to find, but turned out to be uh, fascinating and relevant. The Democratic National Committee's Publicity Bureau under a gentleman named Robert Woolley. We're gonna get a picture here from the New York world. There's Woolley uh, with a bow tie in the middle of the picture, an elfin man who was a kind of genius. And we can lay Wilson's victory uh, in 1916 in part to his uh, clever use of publicity during, during, the, uh, during that election. It also set a pattern that exists today, which is the way candidates uh, use propaganda to win office is also the way they tend to govern. We can see that, for example, in Barack Obama, who harnessed social media in his campaign uh, and then created, once he won, created an office of digital strategy to reach the public directly via social media. And of course, we all know that Donald Trump won in part because of his use of Twitter, and he governed with, has governed ever since with Twitter until he was recently cut off. There are so many entry points. Uh, but one moment to me has always been particularly revealing, and it's the December 1917 Gridiron Dinner, uh, the annual Washington DC roasting by American journalists of government officials. Creel sat at the head table at the Willard Hotel next to uh, Herbert Hoover, who was the conservation chief, the food conservation chief. Herbert scribbled on the menu, okay, on, uh, with regard to the oysters on wheatless crackers and the spiritless punch because hard liquor had just been outlawed in the district a couple of days before. More than one skit involved the kinetic Creel. The burlesquing journalist recalled what was commonly called the July hoax. This was a press release that Creel had personally witten, witnessed which dramatically embroidered a naval account, uh, uh, encounter with the enemy and set off a firestorm of protest against the CPI's willful distortion of facts. In another skit, the journalist joked about the censor, quote, the censor, which was Creel who had deleted the contents of his hip flask. But the most poignant skit of all, as far as Creel was concerned, involved several putative foreign high commissioners who were briefed on the American government. Didn't the government have three branches? One of the commissioners asked. Four, said their American interlocutor, the executive, the Congress, the judiciary, and the Committee on Public Information. When the dignitaries asked what the CPI did, they were told it inculcated a proper sense of respect for the administration. Right now, it's the whole cheese. I mean, it's all to the good, the main squeeze, the grand gazebo, the Lollapalooza, understand? Today, we have the word spin, in 1917, we had the word Creeling, named after George Creel. The CPI was commonly called the Creel Committee. Creel enjoyed enormous power. Here he is actually walking with Wilson uh, in Europe during the Paris Peace Treaty. Uh, and they were, and you can see them walking in a rather chummy way. And that's because Creel uh, had a very close relationship with the president. He told him witty, stor witty stories. And he fed Wilson's contempt for Republican Senate leader Henry Cabot Lodge, whom they both hated. Creel was in every sense pugnacious. Like I said, he had a bulldog face that his mother even thought was homely. In public, he spoke through clenched teeth. As a reporter in Denver, Creel once suggested hanging 11 anti-reform senators. During the libel trial that followed, Creel was invited to repudiate, repudiate his lynching suggestion. No, he said, thumping the witness chair. I meant it. The hemp, the hemp, the hemp. Wilson and Creel had no plan for what did they want, what they want to do with the CPI. Wilson simply created it with a three sentence executive order. This was arguably an unconstitutional act of creation since Congress had paid no, uh, played no role in its creation. But this didn't stop Creel from building it, building on it chaotically and highly inventively, starting in a six by six office in what is now the old executive office building. Let me give you one example of Creel's energy. The creation of the Four Minutemen. 
On the first day of the CPI's existence, a young Chicagoan dropped into his tiny office and proposed organizing speeches in movie theaters during intermissions when the reels were being changed. Creel did not know the young man, but agreed on the spot to do it. The four minute men, and their name came from the time they spoke during intermission, were community leaders. Their localness added to the authority of what they had to say. They were heavily scripted by Washington, however. Each week they were handed talking points and canned speeches with a new theme. Enlist in the military, buy a war bond, send binoculars to the Navy, report suspicious persons, and so forth. Even the conduct of motivational meetings for the four minute men were scripted by, for local chairman by Washington. By the end of the war, there were 75,000 of these speakers, all working for free, all carrying Wilson's message, and in many cases, improvising on the improvis improvisation that they were in the first place. Before the war was over, four minute men could be found in Grange Halls, at picnics, under Chautauqua tents, at 500 logging camps, and in a village pool hall in North Dakota where the lone church was unavailable. Indian four minute men spoke on reservations, Four Minute Men in the Southwest spoke in Spanish. In big cities, they spoke in German, Polish, Lith Lithuanian, Hungarian, Russian, Ukrainian, Armenian, Yiddish, and Italian. No theaters admitted blacks in Brunswick, Georgia, so the colored Four Minute Men spoke at churches and lodges. A Birmingham, Alabama ladies auxiliary had 40 members who spoke in, at theater matinees and to guard, garden clubs. The Four Minute Men of Minnesota sponsored a contest in which students prepared speeches on war saving stamps a smaller version of the Liberty Bonds. This led to the creation of junior four minute men. These prized pint sized orators, orators were told to advise younger children to earn extra money in order to buy war bonds and to urge their parents to do the same thing. They were told to get their parents to lend to the limit to their government. That's a quote. The four minute men programs popped up on colleges campuses. Wounded veterans made up special four minute men divisions across the country. The New Mexico Four Minute Men had 1,500 Four Minute Men, uh, four minute men drivers who, sent, who were sent out around the state. In 1918, right before the war was over, Four Minute Men singing groups began because Creel said people seemed to want to exercise their voices in moments of patriotism. Again, the instructions were detailed. Songs had to be secular and easy to follow, such as Dixie and When Johnny Comes Marching Home. One CPI instructions Told, told the uh, singing four minute men to make sure they, they didn't use music that went too fast. You needed to be use slow time. The four minute men offer a poignant parallel with social media today. The experience of a movie goer in the great war was like ours when we look at our cell phones for a little amusement and receive incidentally a pitch to vote for Biden or Trump. But there was much more than that. The CPI shot propaganda through every capillary of the American bloodstream. It was a publishing conglomerate with pamphlets, news services at home and abroad and syndicated stories and cartoons and thousands and thousands of press releases. The CPI made pre-packaged news a quotidian aspect of governing. It enlisted some of the best writers in the country, some of the best cartoonists. Its division of pictorial publicity produced 1,500 poster designs, cards, advertisements, seals, buttons for 98 agencies and committees, the latter ranging from the Federation of newspaper, sorry, the Federation of Neighborhood Associations to the Salvation Army. The CPI distributed thousands of slides taken by the military. Its advertisements were ubiquitous in newspapers and magazines. Families, families watched CPI produce films and theaters across the country. The CPI piggybacked on motion picture, the motion picture industry, advertising associations, universities, and other professional bo bodies that gave it pathways into the American home and mind. The Boy Scouts, traveling salesmen and corporate titans did CPI bidding. The CPI's propaganda, even when benign, was non-consensual. It spent the public's money to tell them things they did not ask for or necessarily want. It's impossible to seal one's, it was possible to seal oneself off from movie theaters or not even read a newspaper or a magazine, but no individual could avoid CPI propaganda. All they had to do was walk down the street and see CPI posters. In a telling postcard written by the head of the CPI advertising division, uh, he mentioned being out in the countryside in Denver, uh, driving through the countryside outside of Denver. Uh, there was a very famous CPI poster called the, it was a Red Cross poster, and it was called The Greatest Mother, and it was a Virgin Mary-like nurse 
And in his postcard, he said, he saw this postcard in the windows of towns and on the prairies, towns hardly as big as this postcard out in the flat arid lands. The CPI's aggrandizement of Wilson's words and Wilson himself were not merely a national enterprise. The CPI deified Wilson overseas, setting up post-war expectations that Wilson could never achieve at the peace table. The CPI stories carry, carries over into these negotiations in a curious sort of way. Because Creel had alienated so many people while he was in the job, the CPI couldn't possibly carry on when the war was over. Wilson needed to sell his treaty and the CPI could have redeemed itself by helping, but it was out of business. Wilson, however, did not take a remedial action by trying to create another body that could help him shape public opinion to support the treaty pact that he was bringing home. This is a great paradox, uh, one that really helps us understand something important about Wilson. He understood the value of propaganda. He talked about pitiless publicity all the time. And as a scholar, he thought deeply about the value of publicity to lead if one were president. But he did not welcome the give and take that is necessary to work with the press in a normal democratic peacetime environment. The CPI had been an effective shield for Wilson during the war. He did not personally have to engage with journalists because he had Creel and Creel's apparatus to do it for him. If he had adjusted himself to this post-war environment, he could have done much better. <coughs> and here in the story comes Ray Standard Baker, another muckraker and one, I might admit, who I personally admire enormously, who handled press, Wilson's press relations in Paris during the treaty negotiations. I argue that, uh, that Baker constitutes our first presidential press secretary. It was, a it was a frustrating job because, of course, Wilson wasn't very cooperative. And he wrote about it in his diary, uh, a very interesting diary, by the way, in which he said, it is an odd thing that while well, the president stands for pitiless publicity and open covenants openly arrived at, a true position if there ever was one, it is so difficult for him to practice it. He is really so fearful of it. When the war ended, uh, when the war ended, the CPI's offices on Lafayette Square, which now, by the way, are the offices for the Truman uh, Scholarship Committee, uh, those were put to other uses. Many of the files of the CPI disappeared, but systematic per pervasive per propaganda carried on, and so did the kind of techniques that the CPI used. Today, the president and the executive branch have enormous power to shape our thoughts. Journalist, journalist Walter Lippmann went into the war very eager uh, to be a propagandist himself. In fact, he wanted Creel's job. He ended the war disillusioned with what he called the manufacture of consent, which is now, of course, is a famous phrase. He summed up the CPI's legacy in his classic book, Public Opinion, published in 1922. Persuasion, he wrote, has become a conscious art and a regular organ of popular government. We can't, we can't measure the information state that exists today, that is the government information state. It's too big and it's too dispersed. Nor do we have adequate laws to fence it back. And the few laws that we do have aren't enforced. The danger of the information state is not only that it can twist information, it's the act, of, it's the act itself that can be corrosive to democracy. It builds distrust. Right after the war, Harold Laswell, a leader in the new academic field of propaganda, said that all the discussion of, quote, the ways and means of controlling public opinion testified to the collapse of democ democratic romanticism. That credulous optimism had in many minds given way to cynicism and disenchantment. One of the other heroes in the story is Charles Evans Hughes, the Republican candidate for president in 1916. He was a very credible candidate but thanks to Robert Woolley, the man I mentioned earlier in 1916, he, he, uh, Woolley found ways to discredit Hughes, which is quite a paradox considering the fact that Hughes was one of the most accomplished of our public servants in the 20th century and indeed has never had the biography he deserves. When he died, uh, he was ranked as the, one, of the three best, uh, one of the three best secretaries of state, which he, a position he held under Harding, and he was uh, thought of as one of the two best Chief Justices of the Supreme Court. When he was um, at the, at, after the war, he became a champion of First Amendment rights. And he once said, and I think it's important for us to think about this as a slogan for today. There is no, there, the question is no longer one of establishing democratic institutions, but of preserving them. And the events of the last week make that, uh, underscore that dramatically, obviously. So with that, uh, 
quick run through. I'll be glad and look forward to taking questions. That's great, thank you. Um, so in the story, can you tell us, do you think there's a hero that you see in all of this? Well, I think that uh, Baker is a hero. Uh, he was an extraordinary journalist, journalist and very um, and honest and also kind of a polymath given all the different things he wrote about. And his handling of the job as press secretary should be a model today for how people do that job. He saw himself as having an obligation to the president, that is to pass on what the president thought and said, but also he thought he had an obligation to the journalists because the journalists were performing an important function. Vera Whitehouse is another woman who was extraordinary. She was, she, thanks to her, uh, New York actually voted for suffrage they did it shortly before he took, she took her job at Byrne. There's another woman named Josephine Roach who went on to be very famous and worked in the uh, Roosevelt administration. She did wonderful work on immigrants working with the CPI. And another man who I, who I admire enormously and has really been forgotten is a guy named Arthur Bullard who's, who was an expert on Russia and worked for this, helped actually conceive the CPI and then went to Russia first as a journalist. He had been there before uh, and then did propaganda for the CPI. And the propaganda he wrote is a, is a model of what government propaganda should be. It was honest and frank. Um, and he wrote a series of letters to the Russian, uh, letters from, the, from an American, they were called. And they deserve to be a prototype for everybody who works in propaganda today. He died very young, unfortunately. Do you, um, so one of the things that you mentioned in the book is that there's no real, the Congress doesn't really have a definition for, for propaganda. Is there, how, how would you define it? And how do you think our government defines it? Well, our government hasn't defined it legally. The, the, the only way they've ever defined the term is that you're not allowed, the government's not allowed to put out information that purports to be from a third party when in fact it's from the government. In other words, if the if the uh, Labor Department gets a journalist to write about it favorably, but they pay the journalist to do it, then that's considered propaganda. So we have an inadequate definition. Uh, and that's, that's a big problem. If you, don't, if you can't define it, you can't very well police it. There's always a lot of debate about how you define propaganda. The term originally was actually applied to the Catholic Church, the idea being to propagandize, to, to propagate the faith. Um, and that definition obviously doesn't apply in the same way to what governments do. The term was considered rather benign. And today it's really, I think, generally considered an effort to get other people to think what you want them to think rather than to promote open discourse. And so what do you see is the difference between, um, you know, we're not supposed to be paying journalists to do this, but by the same token, we can pay public relations people to then be promoting our information. So it seems like it's a very fine line between, uh, between journalism and public relations. Right, so there's, there's a huge, this is, a, this is the part that I've been interested in, in promoting public discussion on. And I'm glad you asked the question the way you did. A democracy depends on the government putting out information for all kinds of reasons. The first being you wanna know what trade statistics are. You wanna know what the weather report's going to be today. In fact, one of our crown jewels in this government has been the, the amount and quality of high, the amount, the amount and quantity of high quality information. That's a, that's a wonderful aspect of American government. So that's one part that needs to be put up. The second part is uh, the need to, um, for the president to, and, and the people who work for him to explain what their point of view is. In other words, the president needs to propose policies and then provide an explanation and an argument for why we should adopt that policy versus another one. That's part of democratic discourse and it's very important. The problem is that all of those, both of those activities can, can easily stray across the line into, into publicity as opposed to information. So for instance, President Obama can propose Obamacare. Mm -hmm. No problem with that, <coughs> he should. But it's wrong to spend, seven, as he did, to spend $700 million of taxpayer monies by the bureaucracy to promote that policy. In other words, he can stand up and make the argument for it, but he shouldn't be using all of the government's money, our money, our taxpayer money, for the bureaucracy to use its apparatus to do that. 
because basically what he's doing is lobbying Congress, getting the public to go and press Congress to support Obamacare. It, I actually support Obamacare, but that's not the point. The principle is that you shouldn't be using taxpayer money to convince people to believe what you want them to believe. You can use the pulpit of the White House, but that's different. In so many ways, though, don't you think that the context of follow the money is that even with this, it's, you know, you say follow the money, you, if you go back, you find out that creolism and it, 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 there was a, there was a money behind it. And that's how it got, that's how it was propagated. That's how it was spread. Um, that right. if, it weren't, if there weren't money behind it, this wouldn't have, this wouldn't be the way it is. And it's probably the same in today's world with news. I mean, there's money behind the news that we hear. There's money behind the newspapers and the television stations. And in fact, a lot of the news we get is it's to, to sell information. It's to sell television time, to sell air time. So what's your take on that? Historically, what, how did that fall into uh, this story? And how does that relate to things today? Well, the, the difference is that it's, it's not taxpayer money. It's not the dollars we pay the government in our annual taxes to pay to, to pay for the information. Uh, it is true that all kinds of information sources have their own limitations and in some cases gross biases, but that's different from the government doing it. In the case of the CPI, I would just make a small historical note. Uh, in addition to being, I believe, unconstitutional as creation, it also didn't get money appropriated by Congress. Wilson had a war fund and he was just able to give the CPI the money he wanted to give it until the very last weeks of the war, the, C the Congress didn't get involved. Mm -hmm. So basically the CPI wasn't even accountable to Congress, which is an even bigger problem. In other words, in the separation of powers, you don't want somebody to have this huge propaganda arm that is not in any way accountable to Congress. In addition, there was something else that actually does apply today to some extent which is the CPI didn't cost that much money. And the reason for that was that a lot of people work for free or for very low pay. And in addition to that, they got all, they, they managed to get all kinds of in-kind contributions that were free. That is free advertising space in newspapers. Uh, the advertising community worked for nothing. Basically the whole advertising arm of the CPI worked for nothing for a dollar a year. And so you could say that was good, but there's also another problem with that. If it's not appropriated, if the money's not appropriated, then it can't be, it can't be monitored. And, and that, that again could look like an act of patriotism, but it has a downside. It doesn't mean that there's a, the, the checks and balances that should exist did. And that's still a problem today. There are some problems with, with money that, that this, well, I don't wanna get into all that right now, but I think you get the point that there's money that's actually used to promote government programs by the government itself. Right. So let's let's take some questions that have come in. I'll read them to you if that's okay. So uh, you mentioned that George Creel was sued for libel by uh, disgruntled senators. Who won the suit? And did that suit have any impact on Creel? Uh, he, he, the, the, he, won, he won, as a matter of fact, yeah. And when did we start saying, using the word to be Creel, Creelism? Well, when he was gone, from the scene, uh, that word died out. But he, but he, he, he didn't leave. Um, he didn't leave the public scene. He became. He left government. Uh, he had a very active life after that, including being a journalist, uh, being very prolific. He was a. He was an extraordinarily rapid writer, which sometimes got him in trouble. He was also a hyperbolic writer. Uh, he headed the um, programs in the New Deal in California. He ran for election ran against Upton Sinclair to be governor of California. And then at the end of his life, he, he remained always at violently anti-communist as a result of that white Russian uh, disinformation campaign I mentioned, which I went over much too briefly, but maybe I gave you the idea. And in the end of his life, he was, uh, he was, he was a leader in the pro-Nixon uh, pro -Nixon campaign because he was so anti-communist. Um, was there critical press coverage of the CPI at the time? And since Wilson, has there been any large analysis of the history such as yours? Um, it seems like Americans don't know this story very well. Of the press, the relationship with the press? Yeah. Yes. Well, actually, it's funny you mentioned that because that's the, one of my next projects is to write a story just about that. Uh, 
so so that answer is requires several parts to it. First of all, the CPI, uh, the press was wildly supportive of the government. I mean, there were some people who were sometimes critical, and 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 the left, the far left, was critical. Immigrants uh, were, may have been critical in their homes, but they were they were worried about saying anything because of the sedition and the espionage acts. So those presses were basically shut down. So, uh, but the establishment press was was very enthusiastic about supporting Wilson. And I mean, I'll give you one example. In 1918, there was a Pulitzer Prize given out for, um, for a, a monograph on journalism. It was a category that was only given out once. And the monograph was an argument about why the press had done such a good job by withholding information and being pro Wilson. That was the, what the Pulitzer Prize was for. That's an ex, that's an extraordinary. That's just absolutely extraordinary. You should read the monograph. <laughs> I mean, today this would never happen. And there are that many there are many examples like this, including uh, some documents I found that the New York Times, New York World, and others actually. Uh, were supportive of a, of a law that Wilson wanted to pass called the censorship law, which was in part of the Espionage Act, which would have given him something close to um, uh, the, British, uh, the British version, the Defense of the Realm Act. Uh, but, it, but they didn't want to go quite as far as Wilson wanted to go, but they wanted to go a long way. And in fact, I think if, they had, if Wilson had listened to them and done what he failed, by the way, the, the law didn't pass. If that law had passed, it would have been much more difficult to, to address the problems with First Amendment issues that happened later, thanks to people like um, Justice Holmes, Justice Brandeis, and Charles Evans Hughes, there were reinterpretations. But there had never been a law like the one that, that Wilson wanted. And it would, have, it would have made it more difficult for, I think, the courts to, get a, to put the First Amendment on a solid foundation. There were a lot of people that didn't like the CPI because they thought Creel was heavy handed and he was very, he could be very, very heavy handed. And they resented that, um, that he had, that, that they became dependent on him because they couldn't possibly cover all of this large burgeoning bureaucracy. And so they needed help to get this information. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, they also, they also became very attached to the government conveyor belt of publicity and and they recognized that so so they were it was a complex story they were they were patriotic they didn't like creole for the most part they didn't like the cpi but they were they showed up in the cpi offices every day on lafayette square to get the press releases because they needed them how did the disinformation we created and used to see how soviet military reacted become the fake news of today that is directed towards the american public right so fake news that, that disinformation like that is, is designed to, is organized in such a way that some of it appears to be, cre the more credibility it has, the more, the more elements it have that have some credible basis to them, the more effective it is. And in this particular case, there were examples of the, Germ of the Germans having given money to the Bolsheviks. That didn't mean they were Bolshevik agents, but there was, it was never publicly stated, but there was there was there was enough evidence to suggest that was the case. Mm -hmm. The second thing is Wilson really had to justify why he would actually invade this Russia at the end of the war, which is an, a, an event that's not often taught in, in our schools, mm -hmm. but is true. And the and the Russians remember it even if we've forgotten it. So the CPI was a victim of confirmation bias. They wanted to believe that the Germans were were. Uh, had had suborned the Bolsheviks because that meant the Bolsheviks wouldn't be the legitimate rulers, leaders of Russia. And therefore we didn't have to recognize that government, which we didn't until, you know, 15 years later, 12 years later. So the elements of this are that the white Russians who wanted to discredit the Bolsheviks pass this information to the CPI. The CPI buys it completely. These are all fake documents that basically say that Lenin does whatever uh, Berlin wants him to do. And they promote them. And, and the part of the story that's so fascinating is that, and this is not an overstatement, almost every daily newspaper, and I've looked at 
and my graduate students have looked at scores and scores, almost every one used these stories. They came out in a package of five. Mm -hmm. Every paper used at least really used one, and some of them used all five, published exactly the way the CPI distributed them. And only one newspaper in the country raised a question that they might not be true. This shows the tremendous power of the government. And when, and when anybody would say anything to Creel, like maybe these aren't true, he'd say, how dare you say that? Because it has the power of Woodrow Wilson behind it. And so he would, he would ram this down the throats of the American public as, as, as much as he possibly could, and he did. Well, that comes to another question. And does this make sense to think of Trumpism in today's world is the same terms as Wilson and the CPI, given the different ways that Trumpism has operated? Well, I, I, don't, I don't buy the argument that everything Woodrow Wilson did has to be thrown out. He did a lot of good things. And I think we have to see him as a complicated character. And I think in a, many fundamental ways, he was, he was, he was, he was moral and wanted to do the right thing. And I think he was thoughtful. He did have this blind spot when it came to propaganda and, uh, and actually to telling the truth. He once said to, to Colonel House, there's two times you can lie. One is to, about women, about how they look. And the second is to the press about foreign policy, which is an extraordinary statement. Uh, and I don't think that's to his credit. Um, I think what Donald Trump show, has shown us is the ease with which when you think you're right or want to succeed, you can push the boundaries further and further to deliver the message you want to deliver. And in the case of Donald Trump, what do we see? We see him putting his name on coronavirus checks. We see him having flyovers while he's sitting in the link, you know, the Blue Angels fly over the Lincoln Memorial, which gives credibility of what he wants to do. We see him trying to get government government experts who have valid information on things like climate, for example, and trying to suppress what they say because propaganda has two sides, right? One is to get people, give them information that you want them to accept. And the other is to withhold information that might make them think some other way. So it's both a suppression and the provision of information that's that's constitutes uh, propaganda. And we've seen Trump try to suppress information that he doesn't like. And as I said in the beginning of the talk, whenever the CPI came up with this idea that whenever there was information out there that challenged what the administration's point of view was, they called it enemy talk. There are spies everywhere. They're always telling us things. When you say that, you somebody who was a spy told you. By the way, there was only one German who was convicted of being a spy in the United States during the war. And he was a pretty crummy spy, as a matter of fact. He was, he was kind of a dope. That's it. And so today we have a different word phrase we use, fake news. That's just fake news and an attempt to discredit it. And so in, in, the, in that sense, you can see the bridge from Wilson to Trump, but you can't compare them as being absolutely alike. I think the, the lesson we should take away from that is the dangers as the president gets more and more power and the press, the establishment legacy press becomes a smaller presence in Washington, how we try to manage the situation. And, and there are ways to, I think there are ways to do that, including the need to really undertake a, a, stu a real study, a government, you know, a government study of, of, of well, what the powers so, are. So that's another question is, um, what needs to be done to control the ability of the president to use propaganda for undemocratic ends? What, but, what can? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is an audit and find out how many people in the government are involved in information, try to figure out what their jobs are. Get, we don't even have a vague idea of, of what the size of this is. Uh, there are all kinds of people who today have a job in which they're involved with Twitter accounts, for example, and yet uh, they have a job like policy analysts. You, you know, so we need to find out who they are and we need to find out what they're doing. Then we need to define uh, what we think is okay and what's not. We're never gonna get it perfect, but we need to do things like define what's, what's propaganda and what's informational. Uh, we, need to, we need to have, we need to decide we need to have guidelines that are that run across the government. Each agency can come up with its own guidelines. That's a problem. Um, we we probably need to have a, a biannual, um, you know, study done, a, a benchmark so we can look and some some you know we have, we have organizations that look at how we we uh, classify documents uh, from time to time and they do reports. So we could have a body that looked at propaganda.
Do you think that each agency should have its own, if you're saying each agency should have its own standards, would that be too much of a, um, a fracture of what the overall policy statement is? If we're allowing all the agencies to say what, have their, have what, you know, their own standard, what, how does that come across? I think I misspoke. I think there should be one standard. Right now they have their own and there should be okay. one. Okay. So another question, and that was about Twitter, and that is um, with your historical uh, understanding of propaganda in the United States, what are your thoughts on Twitter and the other social media mouthpieces restricting or enhancing president's um, activity? Well, Twitter doesn't have to be bad. For example, if you have a hurricane coming to the Gulf Coast, using Twitter to inform the public is good. Uh, and, and there are all kinds of ways you can imagine the government using, those, using that information. Where I think we don't want them doing is having a, uh, using Twitter to promote a particular policy that, for example, to give you an example, and again, this is something I support, but it, there's a matter of principle as, as opposed to what my own policy preferences are. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a good idea for the Labor Department to, which it did, by the way, under Obama, to put out information to get the public to support a uh, higher minimum wage. I think it's fine for the Labor Department to put out data on wages, tell you what they are, tell you how they're changing. You could even put out data that says, um, shows you what the, what the inflation rate is relative to, the, to, the, uh, to what minimum wage is. Simple facts. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with Obama asking for to wait to to raise um, the minimum wage or for the secretary of labor to argue for it i mean he's political he or she's a political appointee but i don't think we want to use twitter and they did this by the way with twitter to try to get the public to lobby congress to support it because that's that's where the lines crossed i think well and i have to say going back to follow the money twitter and uh, these platforms are, they're based on advertising in space. I mean. Right, but, but, but that's right. But, but government can use them, use its money to put information on Twitter. Um, so another question, Senator Holly has complained that his uh, canceled book deal is a first amendment violation, but it's not government censorship. Would you please explain the difference between government censorship and private censorship and why the difference is important? Well, we don't want the government to censor. And that's one thing that's changed since um, World War I. After World War I, the government began to, uh, the Supreme Court, First Amendment law was in largely in Kuwait as of World War I. There had been very little Supreme Court uh, law that had been written on the issue of First Amendment. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was one of the things that made it easy for the Espionage Act, the Sedition Act, and the Trading with the Enemy Acts, all of those to be supported by the Supreme Court, as indeed it was. Eugene Debs went to jail for saying that, you know, maybe you shouldn't have to go in the military. Uh, he was really a political prisoner. That's what he was. Uh, and it's to Wilson's discredit, by the way, that he didn't pardon him. But anyway, once the war was over. That's changed now. The First Amendment stronger, it is much stronger than it was in World War I. And, and so from the government's point of view, it limits what it can do to censor. It doesn't stop it from censoring its own information inside the government, which we might worry about. People who talk about coronavirus and have data, and should we be getting the data from the experts rather than th filtered through a political optic. In terms of outside, there are no laws that, that tell an independent private organization what can be censored and what can't, because that's not a government concern. Mm -hmm. So uh, a book publisher can decide not to publish a book if they don't want to publish it. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that uh, a lot of donors today are saying that they're not going to provide money to Donald Trump right now, or in some cases to any politicians. So you're allowed to do, th there's, there's, no, there's no prohibition to being um, to, to, to private censorship. I think, I think that's, I think though where we have to, 
I think there's, I'm getting a little stray here and I'm sure I'll have a lot of people who don't agree with this. I, I think actually one of the problems we have is that um, a lot of our media on the right, but also on the left provide highly distorted information. Even, even organizations like MSNBC and Fox and unfortunately CNN these days that, that seem to only very rarely interview somebody that has a contrary point of view. That's a kind of censorship. And being an old fashioned journalist, I object to it. So in today's world, I think that that's a challenge for many readers is to say, well, what, what am I going to watch and, and, and believe what they say? I mean, if you, I, I have a lot of friends and they'll say, okay, I don't, I'm not a big Trump supporter. I'm not on, I'm not a Republican, but I watch Fox to know what's going on in their minds and to see what they're talking about. What, where do we go today if we want to have a very balanced sense of news and not feel like we, it's being distorted? This is just your opinion. Well, uh, we have a lot more responsibility to, to, we have a lot more responsibility to find information for ourselves than we used to mm -hmm. uh, because of the way media works. So, I mean, nobody ever believed the slogan of the Chicago, you know, the Chicago Tribune that it was the world's greatest paper or the New York Times that it had all the news as fit to print. But we now realize that there are, there's so, many, so much possibility for distortion that it does put more responsibility on our shoulders. I, I mean, not that I'm an exemplar of anything, but one way I deal with this is I watch a lot of Fox because I generally don't agree with them. But I, you know, just yesterday, I can't remember what it was. I, I thought, wow, that's an interesting point. I hadn't even thought of that. When I listen to, all I get is confirmation of my views when I listen to people on, who are more liberal. And that's a problem because it's complex. Wait, we, we don't always want to surround ourselves with people who believe exactly what we believe because we don't really know what's going on. We're living in a bubble. What do you think, um, how have interpretations of free speech rights changed since the Great War? Um, well, you know, legally, like I said, I think that I think the right, I think the legal interpretations have 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 improved dramatically. Mm -hmm. Although, just like that quote I used from um, from Charles Evans Hughes, you can't be sure they're always going to stay in place, and we hope they will. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard not to look at our country today, though, and see that the the polarization and the um, that exists is a form of censorship. And in that sense, I think it's probably pretty fair to say that most people would be glad to suppress, many, many people would be glad to suppress speech that they don't agree with. And that that's worrisome. What do you think is the history of uh, conspiracy theory? I think today there's a sense, you know, you hear cons conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists that it seems like a much bigger term. Um, do you know the history of the, of the terms conspiracy theorist and, and why that's blossomed as it has today? Was it, did it exist during the Wilson's administration? Was this historically something? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I have to think, and I, I don't wanna say something I'm not sure of, but I, I think the term, there were terms like conspiracy existed obviously in the war McCarthyism was built on all kinds of conspiracy theories. And so uh, conspiracy theories are not a new idea. I would argue, we don't have enough time to go through this completely, but I would argue that uh, one of the things that makes disinformation so pernicious today is technology, which makes it go viral instantly. Uh, but but I think if you look for the origin of conspiracy theories and misinformation, disinformation, mm -hmm. fake news, you go to the beginning, you go to the, you go to the 15th century when you know, the, the first weekly newspaper in, in Britain started in 1625. And at the same time, Ben Johnson wrote a play called The Staple of News, which was about fake news. Mm -hmm. As soon as you got newspapers, you got you you and you got the idea that people could find out information from themselves. They didn't have to go to the church or the state. They actually could search for information by themselves. There were many who did, and there were many who made stuff up. And 
and this is part of the human condition. Uh, people make stuff up for all kinds of reasons, sometimes for commercial reasons, and some because they want to sell a patent medicine, or sometimes because um, they have a political bias, or sometimes they just want to put stuff in the paper that's interesting. Well, do you see that as the same, the comparison today is big tech and the world in the world of communications? I think all of the things we see today can be traced back three or 400 years. The question is the technology changes, changes it to some extent, but the motivational aspects, whether they're commercial, political, or entertainment, they all existed before. This next question, I, I, uh, I find a fascinating topic. So as a university professor, what are your thoughts about presenting balanced views versus trigger warnings culture? Uh, uh, well, I know maybe you don't know. What's a trigger warning culture? So a trigger warning is uh, there are some at some universities, there have been uh, statements to say this is uh, some schools, the students say, that's a trigger warning. I don't want, we don't want to talk about it. It's not safe. That makes me feel unsafe. No. And some universities like the University of Chicago, among others say, you came to the university not to be safe, but to learn about new things and new ideas and new understandings. So we, uh, as much as we ex uh, respect that you don't feel safe and you want a trigger warning, that's not what people go to university for. So right. the question to you is as a professor, what are your thoughts about presenting balanced information versus keeping our students feeling safe in, um, from the, right. being having a trigger that's going to upset them by learning something? So um, maybe next week I'll make a big mistake and what I'm saying will come back to haunt me. But I tend to be pretty frank in classes, even about my own view. But I also spend a lot of time trying to get to the other side of questions. And for example, because I don't like Donald Trump, I'll often in class, if I teach a class that obviously relates to these issues, I bring up the things about Donald Trump that we need to think about in a different way. I try to be very respectful of both sides. I think the biggest thing we can teach our students, and, and I don't say this in, in a casual way, is to be tolerant. Not to be liberal in the sense of being left, but to be liberal in the sense of being open-minded and to try to understand the other person. And I don't think we, I think we're in a society where that's not happening adequately. And no, I don't believe that a youth campus should rule off, should, should rule out the discussion of issues that are uncomfortable because some of the most important issues in our society are issues that are uncomfortable. Um, but you have to be respectful and you, and, and there are, that's, that's important. And, and tolerant, and tolerant. Tolerant. We we are we are we are a grossly intolerant society. And 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 people like right. I'll give you an example. And I I this may shock some people. I understand how terrible this this um, this mob scene at the Capitol was. And I in no way condone it. And I hope a lot of those people go to jail. And it's a disgrace to this country. There were people who were there, and there are many people in the country who in some way are emblematic, not of the lawlessness, but of the disaffection. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we need to know why they feel that way. We need to understand why they don't feel they're part of this country. And it's not just because 40% of the country is full of bad people. It's much more complicated than that. And we need to know that. And it's not, so I'm not making a case in any way for what happened there in terms of those people doing the right thing. They did the wrong thing. But I think we need to understand what's going on in this country that's this not part of the East and West Coast liberal optic. Well, I thank you for that. And part of what we're trying to do at the Wilson House is to have these conversations and speakers like yourself so that we can help understand and, and discuss both sides of the situation, both sides of the story and, um, and learn. So with that, I thank you very much for today's talk. This was really terrific. Thank you everyone and have a great and safe, uh, a safe and afternoon and take good care. Thank, Thank you. you very much for having me.